Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is my name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. Uh, as part of my role, I coordinate the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, and it's good you are here. Today's webinar is a bilingual one with English and French interpretation. Um, so I just wanted to offer an invitation and reminder of how we, um, how you might choose your preferred language. So on the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, a, a graphic that looks like this, and then please uh, select that and choose your preferred language. So this webinar today is part one part of a broader series with the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. And it's one way that uh, we in the United Church are trying to live into our continued journey towards becoming an anti-racist church. Um, this is one part of a series of webinars with dynamic speakers, and each one is meant to be a time of learning, reflection, and action. The purpose of this webinar today is to focus on anti-Palestinian racism and fighting anti-Palestinian racism in Canada. So with a panel, we will be exploring what is anti-Palestinian racism and how does it manifest in the Canadian context? What are some of the impacts of anti-Palestinian racism on individuals and in the broader community? And how might we respond as individuals and churches? So before we move to the panel, I just wanted to highlight some additional English language resources that are available. One is that this week, there are a, um, a few written reflections that talk about different aspects of anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, there's also a book that we are suggesting that is recommended, uh, The Wall Between What Jews and Palestinians Do Not Want to Know one, About One Another. And this book is available on the United Church uh, bookstore ucrdstore.ca, uh, and there's a discount code if people are interested in ordering two or more books. So that book is available if that is of interest to you. In addition to the books, there are some additional resources available. Um, one, there's an English language newsletter that comes out once a week. If you're interested in signing up, that can give you updates about lots of things related to the 40 days, as well as more broadly about anti-racism. And next, uh, we also have just a little bit to share in terms of this evening's conversation. Um, so the chat for this webinar is closed for today, but it may be that you have some questions that you would like to share to our panelists. If you do have some questions, we'd invite you to please email anti-racism at united-church.ca, um, and we will gather those questions and offer them back to the panel uh, near the end of our time together. So with that, um, we will move now right into our panel discussion. It's going to be facilitated by Patty Talbot, who is now retired, but who is the former team lead for Global Partnerships in the Church and Mission Unit. So welcome, Patty, who will move us through our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Adele. And let me let me add my welcome to that of Adele to everyone who is joining us tonight or who may be watching this uh, this this event uh, uh, later on. We are we are aware that there is another event happening today south of the border, and we warmly welcome those who are able to uh, join us live and uh, know that uh, many others will be looking at this event um, recorded after the fact. I join you tonight from Toronto, uh, which is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Even as I say this, I am mindful that these nations continue to experience colonization and displacement, and that land acknowledgements are offered in place of land itself. It is an honor to moderate this, this panel. And with the ongoing war in Gaza and the horrific anguish continuing there, the urgency in addressing, naming, and resisting anti-Palestinian racism is clear. It is a privilege to introduce briefly our three panelists, and we are very grateful to have them joining us tonight. First, Dania Majid. 
Dania is the co-founder and president of the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association. She is the lead author of the association's 2022 report, Anti-Palestinian Racism, Naming, Framing, and Manifestations. An advocate and leader in the Palestinian and Arab community in Canada, she is also a housing rights lawyer and co-founder and artistic director of the Toronto Palestinian Film Festival. Welcome, Dania. Thank you. Tarek al Zugbi is a Christian Palestinian and American advocate raised in Bethlehem. He is the project and youth coordinator at WIAM, the Palestinian Conflict Transformation Center in Bethlehem. Tarek is currently a visiting scholar here in Toronto at the University of Toronto's Emmanuel College. His research interests relate to issues of justice and conflict transformation specifically economic justice, restorative justice, reparations, and reconciliation. A warm welcome to you, Tarek. Thank you. Robert. Robert Massoud is a Palestinian-Canadian and founder of Zatun, a unique project offering fair trade olive oil from Palestine that is intended to serve as a bridge of hope and peace connecting Canadians to the history culture and challenges of the Palestinian people and the land of Palestine. Robert is well known in Toronto for the meeting place that was opened in 2010, known as Bet Zatun. It became a coming together place, a cultural center for communities struggling for justice locally and globally. Robert, a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Happy to be with you. So let me say just briefly the format that we have for this evening. We have until 8.30, and we're going to begin with the, each of the panelists uh, opening with some, um, some opening remarks, and that will be for about 25 or 30 minutes. The second uh, portion will be some moderated questions, and we hope to have some discussion among the panelists and then we'll move into a time of, and we, we look forward to receiving these questions from those who are participating in, in the, uh, the, the, this webinar. And we hope to have 10 to 15 minutes for that, that opportunity as well. And then we will wrap up uh, with the webinar closing at 8.30. So we have about an hour and a half or a little bit less to go. So with that, um, Let's begin with the first portion of, of, our, of our evening. And I'm going to invite Dania to start. The 2022 ACLA, the Association um, Report, offers a description of the anti-Palestinian racism framework. Can you start us off with outlining what that framework names and the impact that the framing has had since the report was published? Thank you. Uh, I thank you for the invitation to speak with you this evening and to talk to you about anti-Palestinian racism. The critical starting point for any discussion on anti-Palestinian racism is the ongoing Nakba of 76 years, 57 years of occupation, 17, 17 years of the siege on Gaza, uh, crimes of apartheid, and a live stream plausible genocide in Gaza that's been going on for over a year. Um, that has been repeatedly described by UN officials as apocalyptic, as Palestinians are being exterminated through bombardment, starvation, and disease. Anti-Palestinian racism is primarily employed to uphold Israel's settler colonialism of Palestinian land and accompanying oppression against Palestinians, and to provide cover for its unprecedented atrocities by dehumanizing Palestinians and creating the chilling uh, effect and quashing any support for Palestinians or criticisms of Israel, Israeli state violations of international law norms. Uh, for the, it, and everything I'm going to talk about with respect to anti-Palestinian racism uh, today is coming from our framework report that's available on our website, canarablaw.org. Uh, so I'll start with the description that we came up with. Um, and so this is what we did. Uh, this is what you'll find at the beginning of the report. 
Anti-Palestinian racism is a form of anti-Arab racism that silences, excludes, erases stereotypes, defames, or dehumanizes Palestinians or their narratives. Anti-Palestinian racism takes various forms, including denying the Nakba and justifying violence against Palestinians, failing to acknowledge Palestinians as an indigenous people with a collective identity, belonging and rights in relation to occupied and historic Palestine, erasing the human rights and equal dignity and worth of Palestinians, excluding or pressuring others to exclude Palestinian perspectives, Palestinians and their allies, defaming Palestinians and their allies with slander, such as being inherently anti-Semitic, a terrorist threat uh, or sympathizer or opposed to democratic values. And this framework, uh, this description, this framework uh, came about after, um, you know, extensive consultation with uh, both Palestinians and allies from activists to scholars and lawyers um, and those located in Canada, US, the U Europe and Palestine. Uh, because we knew this was work that we really needed input from the community. This was reflecting the community's experience. Uh, and it was very important for us in even before starting this work that we, we had, um, you know, a sense that this was something that the community and our allies was was looking for. So in terms of, for us, anti-Palestinian racism, it was important for us to call it and identify it as a distinct form of racism, uh, especially because of the many forms uh, it takes, as I just described, and how it is really directed towards Palestinians and non-Palestinians who openly support Palestinian rights, or are critical of Israel's treatment of Palestinians. And the reason why we decide to embark on this work is because we have seen anti-Palestinian racism play out in government, media, academia, the arts, and the private sector. Um, and when we are, much of our work is very much focused on the institutional and systemic forms of anti-Palestinian racism, as opposed to you know, what you'll see between individuals on social media, trolls, and, and that sort of thing. We really want to focus on the institutional element of it because it is what is having the most broadest and most harmful impact on Palestinians. Um, and this, you know, this racism has created a chilling effect on Palestinians and the allied community and its work that we have been, you know, working hard towards in, in all our collective spaces. Um, all of us as panelists uh, to under you know to break down that chilling effect or and making sure that it doesn't set in to silence our communities. And you know what we heard as the as the um, Arab Canadian Lawyers Association and and my work in with my other hats is that we always we regularly heard that community members did not know how to describe their experiences uh, of anti-Palestinian racism. And they also felt very ashamed or internalized this racism, um, which, you know, took up very much as an individual and collective toll. They carried shame and guilt every time, you know, if they were ever afraid to speak out on Palestine or if they felt really paranoid to get involved in any Palestinian related work. But they didn't understand why they, they just internalized it and thought they were being weak. Um, so. It was important for us in naming this uh, form of racism to address this burden that, you know, this burden, this racial trauma that we've been carrying. But the spark really for us to really formalize this work came from the scandal we we, we were involved with um, at, the universe, at the University of Toronto Law School, um, where there was a dehiring scandal of a, of a scholar whose work, uh, you know, because of her work on, um, on Palestine, Israel, um, and, you know, a judge, a sitting judge who was also a donor of the um, for the to the law school, as well as the former head of a pro-Israel lobby group, you know, interfered in her hiring and got her and which resulted her in being dehired. Um, so this resource is intended to be used to provide both individuals and institutions an understanding of the experiences of anti-Palestinian racism and the harms in order for people uh, you know, in order for us to be able to help our communities and our communities to help one another uh, address this racism when it arises. Um, this form of racism, um, you know, in, so this was one element of why we wanted to name it in terms of addressing the harms uh, that we experience. 
But it was also really important to understand why we were being targeted in the first place. And in many instances, you know, we would, if we were attacked, we would turn to international law, even if you weren't a lawyer, to try to defend your position. Um, and it was important for people to step back, as we learned in the Azarova scandal, to, to, you know, to step back and ask why are we being targeted in the first place? And to recognize as well the racial harms, uh, you know, the, the racial trauma, the harms that were impacting our community uh, from speaking out. Um, and by understanding it at the community level, we and understanding what was at play, it really helped push back against the chilling effect that our community was experiencing, our allies were experiencing, so we could work together to collectively name and address anti-Palestinian racism when it appeared. Um, it was another point that uh, we needed to address was that there are many intersectionalities with anti-Palestinian racism. And um, it was important to understand the connections with other forms of hate, such as anti-Black racism, as well as Islamophobia, uh, even homophobia. Um, we saw many types of, you know, rate, hate, um, discrimination, racism at play whenever people did speak on Palestine. But it was really important for us to make sure that anti-Palestinian racism was understood to be very, you know, distinct from Islamophobia and not to be conflated with Islamophobia. And this is for several reasons. Um, you know, Islamophobia describes a hatred towards Muslims and the Islamic faith and belief, where anti-Palestinian racism is a form of racism that targets those um, who are advocates for Palestinian rights to suppress any challenge to Israel's occupation and apartheid and now genocide. Um, also by, um, you know, conflating Palestinians with um, Islamophobia or anti-Palestinian Islamophobia, it erases the diversity of, our of the Palestinian identity who, are com who comprise of many faiths, uh, including Muslims, Christians, Jews, Jewish people, uh, Druze, uh, and other smaller uh, faiths so it's important that we want we recognize that I, that diversity of our identity. Uh, and third, um, you know, we also saw by naming it or trying to slide it under Islamophobia, all the resources went to addressing Islamophobia and not actually addressing the roots of anti-Palestinian racism. So it allowed institutions to, um, you know, not put any resources into or the work into addressing anti-Palestinian racism, and it lets and let um, anti-Palestinian racism persist. And lastly, and most importantly, um, it suggests by making the conflation, it suggests that the violence of uh, what you know in Palestine and Israel is a religious conflict, and instead that diverts attention away from the fact that the violence is the outcome of settler colonialism, and that's the roots, um, you know, where our energy, you know that we need to put into is to address settler colonialism. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it at there because I think I'm over time um, and I'm happy to go, you know, expand on anything when we get to the um, Q and A portion. Thanks, Dandia. No, great. And you are not over time. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Tarek, next to you, um, your, your home is in Bethlehem, in Palestine, in the occupied West Bank. Speak to us about the context there and your experience of anti-Palestinian racism uh, in that context. And maybe two, two kind of connected questions as, as you uh, respond. Um, in, in your experience and your reflection, how, how does anti-Palestinian racism intersect or connect with other forms of discrimination? And what does this mean for Palestinians, not only in historic Palestine, but globally? Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a privilege to be part of this panel and to be able to share uh, with you on this important topic. Um, so yes, as you heard, I grew up in Bethlehem and for anyone who has visited, anyone who is able to come and see, it becomes quite obvious what anti-Palestinian racism looks like. And we can look at different levels. We can begin from the micro level, everyday life activities. So when we talk about the basic rights, such as the right to movement, for Palestinians, there is a system of apartheid that is enacted 
by the settler colonial state of Israel, in which depending on your background and depending on your citizenship or residency, you have different rights or different limitations to your movement. So we can begin with some of the limitations to the Palestinian. If you are a Palestinian in the West Bank, such as myself, you have no right to enter the Israeli controlled territories, Israel, or to enter the Palestinian Gazan territory, the Gaza Strip. And that is based on your identity. If you choose to access those locations, you must either apply for Israeli permits, which are hard to come by, or you must try to avoid or to go against the law and hope that you are not caught. In contrast, we have the Israeli entity, especially when we're talking about the Israeli military, which is given de facto power and rule to be in all locations when it chooses to, and is able to traverse the same borders that they themselves run. And so moving a little about movement internationally, for a Palestinian to leave the West Bank, depending on their citizenship, depending on their residency. And the reason I keep stressing residency is because there's a group of Palestinians living in Jerusalem who don't have the right to citizenship. They are neither Israeli citizens nor Palestinian citizens before the law. And I'll be able to speak about them uh, a little bit. Um, but for us to be able to travel internationally, we either have to apply for a permit that gives us the right to travel about 30 miles from Bethlehem um, to get to the Tel Aviv airport, the Ben Gurion airport, to take our flight, or we have to go to the borders starting with Jericho, crossing the many checkpoints, the many barriers to get there, and then relying on the Israeli exit permit, which we hope to attain to be able to enter into Jordan and travel from the Amman airport there. This, of course, is very different for all other groups in the area. If you are an Israeli citizen, you are able to access Ben-Gurion airport without any problems. And if you're an international, you're oftentimes able to traverse and travel through both entities without any additional steps taken or restrictions placed on you unless they are placed by the Israeli state, by the Israeli government. And then we begin to talk about the right to visit Palestine coming from the international world into Palestine. And here we talk about those who are international, who have no tie to Palestine, and we differentiate them from those who are Palestinians in the diaspora and then from those who maybe come from Arabic speaking countries, have Arabic names or Muslim names. And that is because for any Jewish person who wishes to come and live in the state of Israel, they're given the right to come, to move, to receive citizenship and are given supports along the way. The complete opposite is true for the Palestinian who is oftentimes denied the ability to even go and visit and return to enter their historic land, their homeland, and denied at the borders. And that also includes not just the Palestinians in the diaspora, but those who, by the Israeli states, are considered close associates of the Palestinians. And that can be those who advocate for justice in Palestine, but it can also be for those who are simply Muslim or Arab regardless of where they stand on this issue and on justice in Palestine, Israel. We continue and we begin now to look at the some of the economic factors. So before continuing, it's important to state that even though I live in the West Bank and I technically fall under the Palestinian Authority, at a notice at, with security, which does not need to be disclosed for security purposes, it becomes de facto under Israeli military control. And so what we have is a state that is established in these territories that has another state whose power, whose control, and whose authority supersedes the Palestinian state. And that is important to remember. In terms of economics, we see the same living costs, we see the same cost of goods, but we see a very different economic system to advantage those who are Jewish Israeli or international versus those who are Palestinian. 
And this can be seen in the permit system in which Palestinians are able to traverse the borders for a better income at the cost of paying a monthly fee to maintain that permit, but also being paid less than the average Jewish Israeli or the average international, especially international from the Western world, working within the Israeli state or the Israeli controlled territories. We can also talk about the right to family unification. For any Jewish Israeli citizen, they have the right to family unification, can marry a spouse, and oftentimes receive their citizenship in about a year, sometimes less than a year. Where for the Palestinian living in the Palestinian controlled territories, including the West Bank, they have to apply for family unification, oftentimes simply to be denied or to hear no response, such as in my family's case, where we have four people who have been married to Palestinians for over five years now, who have had their rights of family unification denied and the right to live together be contingent upon the receiving of Israeli tourist visas for the international spouse. And that includes the ones that the Israeli state has formally targeted. It doesn't include newlyweds or those who have yet to run into conflict with the law, such as myself and my wife. Um, to speak a little bit about the intersection, all of these foundations, all of these racist practices are founded in oftentimes settler colonialism, in supremacy, and are expressed in the denial of rights, and are expressed in the denial of humanity, oftentimes using dehumanizing rhetoric. And this is something that we can clearly see, especially as the genocide continues. The genocide can be seen also as some of the most extreme expressions of this racist ideology. We see as it continues to unfold, oftentimes the Western world, especially the governments of the Western world, employing rhetoric that safeguards and protects the right of Israelis to self-defense without even acknowledging the Palestinian people or beginning to speak or question about whether the Palestinian people should have the right to self-defense. We also see the continuous erasure of the Palestinian identity. Um, when we talk about the Palestinians locally, we talk about the civil administration of the Israeli state for the West Bank, which under the Israeli state is called the civil administration of Judea and Samaria because the recognition of the West Bank or of the Palestinians cannot be. It cannot exist within this system of apartheid. And similarly, when we talk about the Israelis who are Palestinians, so Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, we oftentimes hear within the Israeli media and the international media them referred to as Arab Israelis, once again erasing that Palestinian identity. And then another commonality that we see with many types of oppression and racism is when the person who is marginalized or oppressed, whether the individual or the group, when they begin to speak out, is we see their voice is angry, their voice is violent. They are oftentimes scapegoated for their own injustices and suffering. And we see their narrative oftentimes mangled, changed, securitized, and oftentimes absent from the mainstream media. And I think this just gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what Danny was talking about and of some of the different ways that Palestinians experience anti-Palestinian racism in Palestine. Thank you, Tarek and, and Wu. Well, We'll want to speak more about that as as we continue in our discussion. Uh, Robert, next next to you, your context is Canada. As a Palestinian Canadian, what did the the twenty twenty two ACLA, the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association report, what did that mean for you? What did that name for you? Um, and connected, what has been your experience of anti-Palestinian racism here in Canada? 
Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here on this, uh, speaking on this topic, because it is very important. And the report in 2022 was really a landmark. And it was a landmark, not because, um, you know, anti-Palestinian racism didn't exist. It existed, I would say, from the very beginning of the Zionist project. It was a landmark because many things came together around that time, including um, the consciousness of, of settler colonialism like never before. Uh, we started seeing Palestine in that light. Racism became um, uh, an objective uh, discussion. And I would also say that for the last four or five years, there was a development of a native Palestinian Canadian voice that hadn't existed previously. So really what we saw was a new generation of Palestinians born in Canada, educated in Canada, now employed and finding their voice. So it has been a very exciting time from that perspective of Palestinians in Canada beginning to stand up for themselves more than ever before. Whereas in the past, whether you go back to the 80s or 90s or whatever, uh, we really relied on um, justice conscious Canadians, particularly in the churches, to really advocate for the Palestinians. And, um, and I guess you could say at that time, um, you know, anti-Palestinian racism was really enforced. It has never really stopped. Um, but we were, as Palestinians, very much under the thumb of it and very much silenced and disappeared. And we are making our comeback. So that, to me, was the, um, the landmark aspect of the, um, the ACLA study and report. Now, at the same time, I have to say very clearly that anti-Palestinian racism is not racism in the classic sense. It's not about uh, racial bigotry. It's not about prejudice. It's really about silencing and disappearing a people through you know, a, a, a form of, of uh, basically political character assassination. So I've lived personally in this country. I came as a young, uh, young boy with my family in the 60s. I can't say that I've ever experienced Palestinian racism as such. Or what I can clearly say is that I have incredibly uh, felt the weight of the silencing, the weight of a disappearing, the weight of, of just not really existing or, or denying who I was, except in very few safe spaces. So I would say to Tariq's point, uh, anti-Palestinian racism truly exists in Israel as racism. But in Canada, it only truly exists as political character assassination. And, so, and this is because I believe that there is a connection between fighting anti-Semitism and anti-Palestinian racism. So uh, in Canada, you know, through the Zionist lobby, the Israel lobby, you know, there is this incredible sense of uh, increased anti-Semitism and the desire to fight anti-Semitism which, you know, we don't disagree with. Anti-Semitism is an evil, a vile thing that should not be allowed to stand. But in Canada, um, the Zionist lobby has been able to link the fight against anti-Semitism with anti-Palestinian racism, i.e. needing to suppress the Palestinian identity, the Palestinian presence, the Palestinian voice, not just of Palestinians, but also of their supporters. So really, the um, you know you could say that anti-Palestinian racism would disappear if there was no anti-Semitism. You know, so they're, they're contingent on on each other. Anti-Semitism or the fight uh, against anti-Semitism depends on the existence and the continuation of anti-Palestinian racism. So. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't exist as racism. What I'm trying to say is that definitely there is anti-Arab racism in the classic sense. There is anti-Muslim racism, but there is not anti-Palestinian racism in the same way that there is not 
anti-Lebanese racism or anti-Jordanian racism. So um, uh, this is just to say that I think it's important that we make a distinction here that this is not classical uh, racism, because if we want to fight against something, we need to understand it and to name it exactly for what it is. So I understand, you know, the idea of racism and, and needing to use that phrasing, because that's what people can relate to. But we also have to understand the uniqueness of uh, what we have come to call uh, Palestine, anti-Palestinian racism. And the way to combat it, of course, then it really comes down to naming it for what it is. And I'm glad that um, the report has done that very clearly. Uh, people have picked up on it, including CJPME, that have started an anti-racism program, of which anti-Palestinian racism is a big part. They've done incredible work on that. Uh, we can speak further on it. And... Um, yeah, so let us continue uh, with, with the discussion. And I would like to keep coming back to the uh, unique nature of uh, anti-Palestinian racism and how we should target it differently, perhaps, than how we target anti-Black or anti-South Asian and other uh, racisms, which are purely you know, the more classic type that are based on racial bigotry and, and ethnic or religious um, prejudice. Thank you. Great, Robert. Well, let's, uh, let's come together um, in, in kind of a virtual circle. Maybe, maybe four is a square or something, but I'm gonna pretend it's a circle uh, anyways. Um, and I, I uh, uh, let's just kind of pick up on on this last comment. I think that that Robert comments that Robert has made because it it links very much to Dania your comments or those in the report that anti-Palestinian racism is a distinct form of racism. Eh? Um, and uh, I, I think of the of the the ways which you have named. Robert named, uh, you know, political uh, character assassination. I think of some of the more, more recent uh, situations that we've seen. Sarah Jama, for example, the MPP in Ontario, silenced. Uh, Yiping Gay, the doctor in Ottawa. These are allies, not Palestinians, but who have been silenced for their, um, their speaking out uh, for Palestinian rights or against the, the violence and occupation. Um, Let's let's move into a bit more of a conversation. But Danny, I, I'm going to invite you to address this this question first, and then I think we're we're doing well time wise, and so we can open up to open up uh, to to Tarek and Robert as well. But let me let me put this to you: um, when when racialized and indigenous people speak out about the oppression they experience. There is often a, a, a kind of an, a, a, an automatic or systemic uh, effort to dismiss or silence, to demonize, even dehumanize um, uh, those those people and those testimonies. Would you would you say that that is true uh, in the context of anti-Palestinian racism? Can you point to ways in which anti-Palestinian racism? Um, is is dismissed or uh, uh, diminished or or denied, and, and what's behind this kind of reaction in the Canadian context? Yeah. So first of all, I just uh, I want to thank my co panelists for for uh, their remarks. Um, I definitely want to highlight, um, you know, what Tarek did say uh, and sort of what he how he described the you know the apartheid and occupation. Uh, of Palestine, because these are inherently racist structures. And this is why we use the term of anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, the racism that's experienced there is flowing into Canada. So I don't actually um, agree with Robert's um, characterization um, that there is that, you know, there is an anti-Palestinian racism in Canada. Uh, our work uh, with the community, uh, the stories that we are being told, uh, is very much, um, you know, forms of racism. They, you know, people are being targeted as Palestinians, um, uh, you know, and and allies who are connected to Palestinians. But 
the reaction that those allies are experiencing is because of Palestinians. So, you know, for, you know, in one example, we, you know, anti-Palestinian racism has not started, obviously, with everything that's happened in, you know, since October 2023. Um, but it has escalated and intensified, and it's much more overt than it used to be. Um, and therefore, it's better documented. And we've been deluged by people who've reached out because they have experienced racism, particularly in the private sector. Um, and though that type of racism was very much hidden until now, now the private sector piece has really come to light. Uh, and we had people being fired, um, you know, in, in being fired for supporting, you know, Palestinians by signing an open letter or posting comment of ceasefire now on their social media, you know, we had comments made by the person firing them. In some instances, these are lawyers, uh, you know, refer referring to Palestinians as effing animals and they didn't use the uh they I'm cleaning it up because of the because I, I'm aware of the audience I'm speaking to but you know it is a level of hatred um that is different than the hatred you will you will see experienced to maybe a Lebanese person or a Syrian person this is a level of hatred that is to the impact to the effect of committing extermination um, that's how that's how deep the hatred going. It's exterminating Palestinians. And that connection is, you know, felt by those here who are trying to fight against that um, extermination. And while we obviously are safer, or, you know, in Canada, uh, at least physically, uh, the real life impacts of anti-Palestinian racism does impact people's well-being, um, livelihoods. And let's not forget what has happened in the U.S. by the rampant of anti-Palestinian racism there. It has resulted in one child being murdered, two children almost being drowned, uh, four youth being shot, one of them now paralyzed from the chest down, uh, in addition to other, you know, adults uh, who have been stabbed, beaten, assaulted, so forth. Um, this is a level of hatred that is unlike um, you know, you know, it, it's, it's a level, it is a deep seated level of hatred. It, this is not just about political discourse and silencing. It is at the essence of it, as we are seeing playing out in Gaza and now expanding, uh, you know, into the West Bank and even Lebanon, uh, a deep seated form of hatred that, um, Palestinians are challenging. Obviously that manifestation of that hatred looks different in Canada, US, Europe than it does in Palestine, but it is very much extension of it. Uh, so I just, you know, I, that's my position on on why this is a form of anti-Palestinian racism. And I can speak to my personal experience and those of my colleagues. You know, I have experienced, you know, racism directly, not because of just, you know, my my political views, but in terms of, you know, applying for a job and being asked if I advocated for the destruction of Israel in my job interview. Um, you know, there is there is you know, the comments that are made to attack me are very much racist comments. Uh, and I won't, I won't elaborate, but it's the, it's the typical things that I'm, you know, being anti-Israel, um, terrorist, you know, I'm a, you know, a terrorist supporter, uh, because I signed an open letter supporting law students who were being attacked. And those very students were exonerated by the investigation um, you know, into those letters, but the attacks have not stopped. Um, lawyers are still being fired for supporting them. Um, and the smearing campaign continues again, you know, to discredit us, to silence us. Um, so I probably have not answered your question because I, I've gone off track, but the manifestation is again, just to point out, it's not just personal. It is very much coming at an institutional level, starting with our government, and it is putting Palestinian communities at risk. Again, I mentioned the acts of violence, but let's be real. Um, in Toronto, we have seen police violence. When protesters go out and protest and commits, you know, what is, you know, they're being charged or they're being charged with mischief, right? Mischief you know, putting up a poster, chanting from the river to the sea, really low bar things. 
the Toronto police force is employing the guns and gangs type tactics using the hate crimes unit and kicking down people's doors at 4 a.m guns drawn and arresting protesters in their bed in front of their family handcuffing them and dragging them away those protesters then experience loss of jobs so they're either suspended or fired uh we've heard of people losing their apartments because the police have kicked down their doors and the landlord isn't happy about that or the roommates don't feel safe about, you know, so people have become homeless uh, as a result of it. There are real life impacts of how this is playing out. Um, and it's coming from the Ministry of the Attorney General that has a committee, a, you know, that a, sort of a hate crimes uh, committee that is going after these uh, protesters. The Toronto Police Force has a, this designated hate crimes unit that is targeting protesters. We saw this story in, in, in Ottawa of the Palestinian woman who herself was attacked and the Crown prosecutors threatened to charge her for chanting from the river to the sea. It's saying that she was making a genocidal, um, you know, she was inciting genocide, even though she was there to protest the genocide of her own family and friends in Gaza as a Palestinian who has, you know, and it's collectively, we have the responsibility to speak out against genocide and push our governments to, um, to you know, uh, prevent and, and stop a genocide. And when they don't, it's our responsibility to speak out. And when we speak out, we are being criminalized. Uh, and this is something that's dangerous. Then we have government policies and statements statements that labeled Palestinians and those who participate in protest as Hamas supporters. What happened then is employers run with those statements and use it as a ground to fire their employees. And we have seen that. Uh, employees being fired for wearing the kafia in the workplace or for attending protests, for posting on social media and it being reported to, to their employers. We have government policies um, coming out, like the defunding of UNRWA, which is the most vital humanitarian link for Palestinians. This is done, you know, again, using the terrorist link without any evidence. Uh, the immig Gaza immigration process is another example of institutionalized government anti-Palestinian racism. And we have, we see Canadians from Gaza or their relatives who are, you know, abandoned, uh, unable to travel and have to go over, go through huge bureaucratic burdens because they are labeled as a potentially, you know, Hamas, a terrorist. And so we can't just let them in. And, and as a result, they are, they are dying before they can get their paperwork processed. Uh, the examples are countless. But again, the importance is recognizing the institute where, you know, where it's coming from. And it's institutional and it's systemic. And because of that, it is having such a broad impact on the community at large. Thanks, Dania. Tarek, I mean, Dania is speaking about systemic efforts uh, in Canada uh, to, to, to silence, to diminish, to target uh, Palestinians and, and their allies, something I think um, you're probably well familiar with from the context of, of the occupied territories. What, what can individuals and, and, and organizations like churches who um, are concerned about uh, 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 protecting human rights, uh, opposing the, the occupation, what can individuals do to critically engage with public coverage and narratives on Palestinian issues uh, and name anti-Palestinian racism for what it is? when it's happening? Thank you. Um, it's an excellent question. Um, I think to start off with, it's very important that we continue to educate ourselves. Uh, if our education and all the information we have is coming from the mainstream media, then we know nothing at all. Um, and I think when we are interacting with these narratives, with um, with social media, with mainstream media, it's important to have a critical eye. And some things that are very important to look out for is what the narrative is saying, whether implicitly or explicitly. So any attempt to monolithize a group that is very diverse, that's likely for the purposes of supporting the continued practices 
in this case of oppression of the um, Israeli settler colonial occupation. Um, and within that, we see this coming up over and over again. When we talk about this war, um, quote unquote, we oftentimes hear headlines such as Israel and the Hamas war. We hear Israel and the Iran-backed Hamas war. We Rarely do we hear Israel and the Palestinian people. Rarely do we hear Israel and the Gazan people. And that is mostly because they do not stand on their own in terms of allowing people to be subdued by the narratives, by the messages, especially when we look at the level of destruction, at the level of devastation that the Gazan people have faced. Um, and so going along with that is what is the terminology that we're using to describe these groups and these people being critical of that and reflecting on that. I cannot tell you what terrorism is or what terror is. And most likely there are about a zillion definitions that we use, but I can tell you what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to react when I hear that term. And we oftentimes see this term specifically used exclusively for Palestinians, for Arabs, for Muslims. And so to be critical when we hear this terminology, because it tries to assert a narrative in which a people has committed some atrocity without any understanding of grievances, without any understanding of the injustices that they've endured, it is used purposefully, intentionally, to stop the conversation there, to solicit a reaction, and to solicit what we see is complicity, to allow ourselves to continue to be complicit in the ongoing genocide and occupation of the Palestinian people. I think other things that are important to be critical and aware of is also tying into anti-Palestinian racism we oftentimes see this war as being the first action or activity that disrupted the quote-unquote peaceful times that Palestinians and Israelis or Arab more likely and Israelis were experiencing. Refusing to acknowledge the violent rocket attacks, the violent daily incursions into the West Bank, the uh, rocket attacks in Gaza, the embargo and blockade that has been placed on Gaza, the attacks in the neighboring Arab countries, the continued occupy, occupation and annexation of land, the continued occupation of the Golan Heights with, since it is election time in the U.S., which of course the U.S. system and the U.S. governments have been fairly together on. Israel-Palestine is the one place of convergence between the Democratic and Republican Party. And so also asking within this, in the resources that I am hearing and watching, where is the Palestinian voice? Is it off to the side? Is it central? Is it shared? Or is it simply interpreted, if it exists at all? So being able to look not just at the information as it's presented, the language and framing around that information as it's presented, but also looking at who's presenting it. And going a little bit off topic, one of the things that I wanted to say and maybe share in response to what Dania said, when Israel was first created, it's important to understand that these systems of apartheid, of racism, of discrimination, they feed off of each other. They're interlinked and they oftentimes find the way of interlacing within the expression. Um, and so Right off the bat, before Israel was created, we had the British Mandate of Palestine, which enacted the emergency laws in which a Palestinian or an Arab under the British Mandate was seen as guilty before being proven innocent. And that allowed for the taking away of liberties, including the placing of Arabs here, Palestinians, under administrative detention. And this is one of the laws and systems that Israel has given new life to from its creation till today. 
And so going along with that, the first Israeli prime minister in a famous speech, um, or sorry, in a letter, wrote that there is a population living in Palestine, a group of close to 100 to 200,000, and he used a derogatory term that is, that is oftentimes used derogatorily against black people, the N-word here. And so we do see these types of racism feeding into each other. Similarly, when my family was in Haaretz in the one of the main Israeli newspapers, because of the lack of family unification we had, my father, who is a bit um, darker, more brown, I'm more white passing, some of the comments that we received was, send this African back to Africa. Some um, commentators who use the N-word against the family. And so we see that these racisms are deeply embedded into each other's structures, mm -hmm. and they have to be. This is why we see racism and discrimination persist in Canada. If there wasn't discrimination and racism against the indigenous communities, against people of color in Canada, it would be much more difficult to continue to experience and allow for anti-Palestinian <laughs> racism. So I just wanted to insert that briefly. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Truly chilling. Uh, <clears throat> Robert, you know, we're, as was named at, at the beginning of our our uh, our panel uh, tonight, we're 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 talking together as as violence and and suffering continues on a, on a truly horrific scale in in Gaza. Some might say that there is increased awareness in, in Canada of the particular ways in which racism is experienced, uh, racism is directed toward and experienced by Palestinians. Even though Palestinians, as Tarek and, and, and Dani have been saying, have been living with this experience and this knowledge for, for decades. Um, have you observed in the context of, of Toronto, of, of Canada, uh, an increased an awareness of anti-Palestinian racism. C could you say a little bit about that? Of course, I mean, absolutely, there's an increase. Um, but I just wanted to comment about what Daniel was saying. It's, you know, I <laughs> there is no denying the consequences and the impacts of anti-Palestinian racism. I was just thinking of trying to distinguish the source of it. And the source of it is, in, to my mind, is not organic, racial prejudice, it's politically motivated uh, marginalization and maligning. And so just like everybody, including Dania and Tadek, I have been a victim of that kind of racism. I just wanted to point out the source of it. And the source of it is, you could say, the primacy of the Zionist narrative in Canada. And we're talking about Canada, not about Palestine here in the sense of, you know, anti-Palestinian racism in Canada. And so to me, it's very important. And it gives me, you could say, a bit of comfort to know that the racism I experience in Canada is not directed at me personally, organically out of racism and ethnic prejudice. It's because of the Zionist narrative, which has made me the enemy in institutional circles and using those institutional tools to pass it into the culture, the socio-political culture. And I think it's important to make that distinction. Now, in terms of the impacts of the last year, let's year particularly the last year on increased anti-Palestinian racism, absolutely we see it because the Jewish state and its various Zionist machinery in the West have gone into high gear. And in order to cover up for the various activities through the genocide and the killing, the murder, and um, the, the, the um, targeting the journalists and the doctors and the children and the humanitarian aid and so all of that requires an incredibly increased cover up, incredibly increased attacks on Palestinians and suppression of their voices. So whenever you that you know that takes place, it just becomes that much more apparent of what's at stake, what the forces are, how they're being expressed, and that translates into a greater awareness of 
that racism and the impacts. And it's, you know, it's undeniable. You, and, and Dania did a very good job of enumerating the untold numbers of uh, examples. So, so you could say, you know, <laughs> increased racism or impacts is, is directly proportional to the crimes that are being committed. That's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Let's let's see if there's uh, some question, any questions that have come from the uh, the the uh, other participants, the audience that gathered here. Um, you'll be reminded that the uh, the email is uh, anti hyphen racism at united hyphen church dot ca. Adele, can we bring you in to see if there have been questions coming to you uh, that might be raised now? Yes, thank you for asking, Patty, and thank you everyone for the conversation so far. Uh, there is one question that I will pose into the chat here. Um, it's been explored a little bit. Um, but what are the main obstacles to overcoming anti-Palestinian racism in Canada? Great, let's, let's have a go round on this. Who wants to go first? Dania, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I guess it really depends in many instances, the context we are talking about. Um, but, at, you know, I mean, at the most basic level is the lack of recognition of anti-Palestinian racism or the denial of the experiences that Palestinians uh, face, its justification. Um, and we see this play out where, you know, people will say, I've had this experience where I feel like, I've, you know, I've been silenced or canceled event, uh, you know, the film screening got canceled. And it's obviously to us, those in the space, um, uh, you know, know what it is. It's anti-Palestinian racism. But, you know, those who are in charge of making those decisions deny it. Uh, so we need in, in at the institutional level, as we have learned from other communities and, and how we've tackled other forms of racism in, in our institutions, we need them to recognize anti-Palestinian racism. Uh, it impacts, uh, you know, if you look at, if you just take the poll numbers in Canada, the majority of Canadians, uh, you know, have some type of support for Palestinians, depending on how the question is phrased. But the majority of Canadians, you know, think what's happening in Palestine is wrong. Uh, if the majority of the Canadians spoke out, then, you know, that means the majority mm -hmm. of Canadians are also have the potential of experiencing anti-Palestinian racism. It is not something that happens to a few of us. It happens to us collectively. And then it will impact other communities. And there was something that came out today, for example, uh, that, you know, that took my interest. And um, uh, a mayor of a particular city posted a photo of someone who caused a lot of disruption in Brampton last night, uh, an instigator. And he called him out, put his picture up and just called him as he is. And, you know, and, you know, criticized him for, you know, incitement of violence, which had led to some interfaith um, protests uh, at, a, at a place of worship. Now, this exact same person has been coming to Palestinian events for decades, saying racist things um, against us. And we have called it out to institutions and to the mayors and, and you know, to say this person is a problem. Uh, he's been charged, you know, he's, he's you know, been taken to court over his comments. He's done the fake apology under defamation claims and so on and so forth. But he was never called out when he was attacking Palestinians. And now he's leapfrogged into attacking another community. Had we addressed this, you know, this person, this problematic person, and recognize the anti-Palestinian racism that this person has been spewing against us for mm. so long, then maybe he wouldn't have targeted or, you know, been as emboldened to target another community. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that, you know, the fact that people are denying, you know, that's how that's how anti-Palestinian racism, it's denying the art even experiences anti-Palestinian racism and not, and be, by not recognizing it, you know, we are left to, you know, fend for ourselves. 
And what I hear from the community is they do not feel safe and they do not expect their institutions to keep them safe. So, you know, we are hearing, you know, distrust of the cops, even in, in you know, in, in situations where there is a potential security threat, the community does not want to work with policing or invite policing in. Uh, they instead are setting up their own marshalling system to protect themselves because they see the police as a threat and they are not wrong. Um, we have, because there's been anti-Palestinian racism expressed by the medical community, uh, and many times it plays out in Twitter openly where doctors are saying exceptionally racist things about Palestinians. We have heard from the community, people are now afraid to seek medical care uh, because they, they have lost faith that, you know, the doctor they might be seeing would give them proper treatment because they are Palestinian. Um, and so they're now seeking other, other doctors who might be, um, you know, of a faith or, or background that they feel like will not express hatred towards them. So the, this lack of institutions address, recognizing anti-Palestinian racism as the first step is really causing, you know, our communities to be vulnerable. But, you know, that being said, because the communities now have the framework, the ACLA framework, they have been doing an excellent job pushing back and demanding that, you know, their institutions and the government recognize anti-Palestinian racism. And we have seen as a first step, the Toronto District School Board recognize anti-Palestinian racism. That does not mean they have stopped behaving in a way that is anti-Palestinian, you know, that expresses or perpetuates anti-Palestinian racism, but there's a pathway to now address anti-Palestinian racism when it arises at the school board. Um, so, you know, it is a conversation we have to keep pushing because we really need to get that recognition um, in order to get the institutions to do it. But let's not, you know, like I praise the communities that have been doing this pushing to make sure it does get recognized and and taking care of one e each other um, when when it does it does present itself in their in in their context. <clears throat> if Robert, yeah, Patty, please go ahead. Add, mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could add something. So, um, in terms of obstacles, mm -hmm. one of the obstacles to overcoming it is is basically Canadian societies and Canadian institutions' willingness for decades and decades to privilege the Jewish community's welfare and concerns over practically everything else, and in particular, the Palestinian presence, the Palestinian identity, the Palestinian aspirations, Palestinian participation. And so if we're talking about overcoming anti-Palestinian racism, we have to confront as a society, as individuals, as a church, as congregations, as a hierarchy, that we have had a long history of privileging Jewish concerns at the expense of Palestinian community. And that's the cause. We can just, we can talk, talk, talk about anti-Palestinian racism, but we need to find and search for the cause of it. And my research has led me to this real essential privileging of the Jewish voice and the Jewish concern in this country. And so if the, the United Church or any other, mm -hmm. you know, faith-based organization or individuals, wh wh whatever identity they have, um, need to really get the courage to say to their Jewish friends, you know, our friendship our allyship, our conversation is not going to get in the way of our support for the basic Palestinian rights in this country. And we're not going to allow our Jewish friends, because I've heard a lot in the, in the you know, United Church and other churches, well, we can't do this because our Jewish friends will be upset or our Jewish friends will be uh, feel uncomfortable. And we get it all the time. So, you know, students are uncomfortable in the classroom. Therefore, the Palestinian students, the Palestinian, you know, groups and so on are suppressed. So to me, 
that is a basic recognition of the main obstacle to um, to change and making it better uh, for Palestinians in this country. Denial, dismissal. Yeah, Tarek, I was just going to summarize and, and denial, dismissal of Palestinian experience, the, the privileging of, of Jewish community voices. Tarek, what would you add to the obstacles sure. named? Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to make a quick point, which I think is always important, that part of the reason the Israeli narrative is so strong is because we continue to allow it to be conflated with Jewry and Jewishness. Mm. And so I think it's very important in recognizing that just like the Palestinian people are diverse, so are the Jews of the world or world Jewry, culturally, ethnically, etc., and so within this, we continue to allow the co-opting of the Jewish identity as it relates to Israeli interests to further it, preying on the awful anti-Semitism of the past and preying on the guilt that comes out of that. And so I think, but speaking also more broadly, Christian Zionism, Christian Zionism, which is intertwined <laughs> Um, oftentimes with political systems, but also becomes a crisis of identity and faith. We have, unfortunately, in Christian Zionism, it has been practiced that the fulfillment of the prophecy is with the creation of the state of Israel, where in practice that is God's prophecy, God's desire, God's wish is fulfilled through the ethnic cleansing of a state. And there we have a problem. We either deny that this is not the state of Israel in prophecy or that the prophecy was wrong, or what's easier, we leave our faith in check as we interpret it as it has been interpreted for us, and we deny that a genocide is going on, or that occupation has been going on, or that settler colonialism has been practiced. And Amen. furthermore, we talk about complicity. Oftentimes when I'm having conversations with people around making sure that we're investing ethically, the response is, well, the system isn't going to be changed, but what will change is the profit I'm bringing home, the ability to sustain our work. And so then we see, as we've seen through histories, as we saw with um, enslavement in the USA, the privilege that we have as the privileged group is too great and it, it's greater and it speaks louder than the marginalization of the oppressed. And so part of this is coming to terms with our own complicity. And that complicity is through the companies that we continue to buy from, that we continue to invest in, the stock market, but it is also through the industrial military complexes and the industrial prison complexes that are very strong in Canada, and maybe if we proxy the USA as well, in the <laughs> USA, which Canada is deeply complicit in. And so then to speak up against um, injustice, against oppression, is then framed not as working for justice and liberation for all, but instead it's working against our own pockets. Mm. And so part of this is coming to terms with our own complicity. And it's the same. And this is not a new idea. We heard Martin Luther King Jr. say this and many others who say injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so beyond the economic complicity in Palestine, Israel, we're also deeply complicit in the continued marginalization of marginalized and oppressed groups here in Canada, in the global north and much around the world through the global economy. Mm -hmm. We are here speaking about Palestine while a genocide is happening in Gaza, while a, another genocide is happening in, well, in the Congo, in DRC, because of the technology, because of the mining and exploitation of the global south that we are deeply complicit in. And so part of this conversation necessitates us being able to speak to our own complicity and building that community with each other 
And then the last point that I want to leave us with is anti-Semitism. Mm. Because a lot of the framing around this is anti-Semitic. It is anti-Semitic to believe that Jews can only be safe in a Jewish state. And that is something that we hear a lot of in the U.S. We also hear that in the Canadian government. It is equally anti-Semitic to believe that a Jewish state can only exist as a genocidal settler colonial entity. And so part of this is also being able to challenge those two notions and being able to say, hey, we've got it wrong here. Let's talk about this. Let's be critical. And let's work to end all injustices, understanding that they're all interconnected. And since, you know, we all live and share the same earth and its resources, as the sea rises, all boats rise. And we're rising to very high and dangerous levels. Amen, Tarek. Thank you. I, I, I've been sent one other question, and I want to work it in um, because it was it was one that was sent to us. And it's, there's a bit of a preamble, but I, I think it, it's it's an important one to share. Um, the person who sent it said thank you to each one of the panelists. Robert mentioned CJPME, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, and their anti-Palestinian racism work. I have participated each week in their media accountability project and can say that at least 50% of the media items I have responded to in the past 14 months contain an element of anti-Palestinian racism. The ACL, a Arab, Arab Canadian Lawyers Association report has been so helpful in helping me frame my responses. Dania, are there other ways we might use the APR report and its content in both Palestinian solidarity work and in anti-racism work? Yeah, I mean, the report was designed um, to be accessible. So we wanted high school students to use it, parents uh, of students in public school, university, you know, students at university, people in their workplaces, it was really designed um, or written with that in mind that it was a tool. Uh, you know, we unfortunately do not have the resources to kind of swoop in and address APR wherever it presents itself um, in Canada or abroad. Uh, but we really wanted to use the report to empower people wherever they happen to be in um, to be able to take this framework and either proactively uh, you know, have their, you know, anti-racism policies or their anti-harassment policies also acknowledge um, anti-Palestinian racism. Um, so we've seen it. So I, I can give you examples of where we've been seeing it used or where the discussions have been happening, but it's been in unions um, because APR is a worker's right, uh, is a worker's issues. We have seen employers, you know, telling workers what they cannot, what they can't do outside of work hours and what they can't post on their social media. This is an over, this is such an overreach um, that I th most employees do not know that um, exists. Um, so we have seen unions talking about um, acknowledging anti-Palestinian racism um, and making sure that their workers are protected and it could be, you know, recognized or addressed in collective agreements to make sure that workers are not censored and their freedom of expression is protected. Again, I've mentioned the school boards. We have seen several school boards in Ontario uh, recognize anti-Palestinian racism in their anti-racism policies. Same thing um, uh, at, at the university level as well. Where And at the university level, it was student driven. So we've seen it in encampment agreements uh, and other motions around addressing racism at the university level, again, pushed forward by the students. And even the students um, in the U.S. have been using the ACLA report uh, as the basis. So it provided them with a framework that they could then use to push on it. Um, we have seen um, in the arts space, same thing, um, you know, with the cancellation of, of film screenings, uh, censorship of artists who've, who have done work that expresses that some form of expression on Palestine. Uh, we have seen curators fired for a curating work around Palestine. Uh, it has also become an issue in those spaces. And again, they are, you know, creating 
mandates, statements, principles that calls out um, anti-Palestinian racism and makes sure that they have a gallery space or a creative space free of anti-Palestinian racism, along with other forms of racism. So I don't mean to exceptionalize anti-Palestinian racism. This work is being, um, you know, done in solidarity with or in conjunction with, you know, addressing other forms of racism. And, and Tarek did a great job enumerating how, how you know, there are many issues and they, they are in many instances are intersectional. Um, so it is a tool that can be used proactively to bring to bring that recognition in, but we have also seen it in in reactive spaces. So many lawyers now who are working with clients who have experienced anti-Palestinian racism, whether it be in the criminal sphere or employment sphere or civil sphere, uh, have been using the ACLA report to talk about um, and describe that client's experience as racist. Um, and this was really important in the U of T encampment cases where they say intervened in that case to demonstrate that anti-racism um, was at play in the university's response uh, towards the encampment, but also how they characterized the students by saying that the encampment was inherently um, anti-Semitic and violent and supported terrorism. And in the way they, um, you know, try to blame the students for everything related to Palestine in the entire city, um, or at least the downtown portion of the city. Um, and what was really valuable, even though we did not like the outcome of that decision, but the judge in that case did recognize, importantly, that anti-Palestinian racism was in fact uh, something the students experienced and, and exonerated them and their work and their organizing as, as you know, exonerated as not being anti-Semitic or violent. The same thing happened in the investigation at the TMU uh, of the TMU law students who wrote an open letter uh, that they were completely, you know, attacked for. In the investigation that happened at the, you know, into this into the letter um, and the reaction by the law profession, the legal profession towards these students, anti-Palestinian again racism again was um, recognized, and and we were there as a witness to provide. Uh, you know, evidence or, or, you know, provide feedback to the to the retired judge who was overseeing it. And we they looked at the report and came back to recognize what the students experienced was anti-Palestinian racism, that they weren't anti-Semitic or, you know, inciting violence and called the legal profession out for their behavior towards the students and recommended that anti-Palestinian racism be incorporated. So depending on the context, it is a tool and it's a tool, it's an empowerment tool. It's an educational tool. It's, um, you know, it's a defensive tool, uh, but it was definitely, it was written so it can be used however it is needed in, in a variety of um, places um, where anti-Palestinian racism may arise. This this webinar tonight was the the purpose um, was it was to address anti-Palestinian racism, the issue of anti-Palestinian racism and and the evil that it is in, in Canada and globally uh, to not only name it and frame it, but as you have said, Dania, just now to resist and oppose. Um, and we want to even in these last couple of minutes. Uh, take a moment or two to stress that that people have come together i think from a desire not only to 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 learn and know more but to be better equipped to resist oppose and fight back mm -hmm. um, and you've named that the the acla report should be and and can be used as a tool so i would say to everyone if you haven't read it read the report and 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 uh, you're being encouraged now by all of us to to see how that might be used as a tool um, in in the fight against anti-Palestinian racism. But just very quickly, and I'm just going to do a, a quick go round, starting with you, Robert. Um, m many uh, of the individuals uh, joining this webinar tonight are people of of faith. Um, certainly, people who I would say are concerned about the rights of Palestinians and. Uh, deeply concerned about the continuing violence and occupation in, in Palestine. Um, could you name one or two concrete things? We've named the report, read it, use it as a tool that uh, would encourage and equip people uh, committed allies uh, of Palestinians in Canada and globally. 
Well, I mean, certainly, as I was saying, um, particularly to faith groups, um, um, not privileging the biblical voice as expressed in a, you know, philo-Semitic kind of way as the people of God, but recognizing that we're all people of God and we should all have equal dignity before God and before each other. Um, in terms of concretely, I can only really point to CJPME and two programs that they have. One was mentioned by the uh, the person who was spoke uh, question wise was the MAP, the Media Accountability Project, which really is incredibly powerful, incredibly impactful, has shown tremendous results. You can uh, certainly um, support it with financially. That's very easy. You can become an active member and just as with that person contribute to letter writing and correction in face or directly to the various media outlets. The other one is the CJPME Foundation, um, separate from CJPME, the organization, CJPME Foundation and their anti-racism program uh, again, very powerful that um, tackles head on issues of racism, including anti-Arab, anti-Muslim and anti-Palestinian. Those are two very concrete programs that need to be supported, that people can participate in actively. And that's the best uh, start Great. that I can think of. Great. Thank and you. again, CJPME is Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, cjpme.org. Tarek, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one or two concrete things. I know you've said many, but uh, just as a way of, of, of wrapping up and, and encouraging and equipping people to, to name, frame, and oppose anti-Palestinian racism where, where it is. Yeah, I think uh, one very simple one, aside from educating oneself, is to become critical of what we consume. And I think in any time in which we hear about oppression, about destruction, however it's framed, to ask ourselves, what does a person have to do to justly suffer this? And hopefully what we find is the answer is there's nothing that anyone ever did or has to do to suffer any form of oppression, of genocide, of occupation, of settler colonialism. I think the second concrete one I can think of is doing what we're doing right now. Continue to engage and promote an anti-racism and an anti-racism uh, education and to promote these policies and this education in school. We are all intertwined, we're all interlinked, and I cannot effectively oppress another without having that embedded in my society or in the structures of my society locally. And so just with that, a big, big thank you for Adele's work and for your facilitation and for everyone who made this possible and for everyone engaging in it. Power to you. Tarek, you're taking the words from my mouth. Uh, a, a deep, I know uh, Adele is going to say a word of wrap up and thanks, but uh, on on uh, from my own lips, I would like to say a deep thank you to Robert, to Dania, to Tarek for your uh, willingness to join us tonight, for the deep passion, for the advocacy, for the justice which you embody. We are deeply grateful. Adele, over to you. I will offer at, uh, at words of thanks, um, Robert, Tarek, Dania, thank you for your inspiring words today, for your words of challenge, for your very concrete actions, uh, and for being here tonight. And thank you, Patty, for facilitating the conversation with such ease and grace. So thank you to all. Um, I am putting into the chat uh, some links to uh, a survey, a feedback survey about this evening. It's available in English and French. If you would like to click on it, it's a very short four question survey that you are welcome to fill out and um, share some of your perspectives. Uh, that would be welcome at any time. And um, as well, if you're interested in um, the reporting from this event or following up on, on, on related things for the 40 days, it's all uh, capsuled on the website here. So thank you once again, everyone, for being here. Um, blessings on your continued day and uh, pray and hope that you are inspired into action. Uh, and thank you once again to our panel members and for all. <laughs>